All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, this is the second webinar uh, in a series from the Halt the Harm Network. And today's webinar is titled The Advocate's Toolkit, Resources for Tracking the Harms of Fracking. Uh, my name is Chris Casey. I work with NetCentric Campaigns, a nonprofit organization that builds online advocacy networks. The Halt the Harm Network is one of those networks. Um, and the, the purpose, the point of the Halt the Harm Network is that it's an advocacy network that connects leaders who are working to halt fracking's harms. Uh, so what's a leader? A leader is anybody uh, who is an individual working actively and uh, collaborating to help those who are living in communities negatively impacted by fracking. There's a lot of types of leaders in the network. Some of them are full-time advocates that work for other organizations. Some are uh, health or science uh, experts. Some are authors and filmmakers. And, uh, and plenty of them are just individual concerned citizens. One of the fundamental goals of the Halt and the Harm Network is to connect leaders to each other and to facilitate new connections and opportunities for collaborations among leaders in the network. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is through a leader directory. Uh, leaders within the network have access to this directory, the ability to build their own profile, uh, to browse the profiles of other leaders in the network, uh, to filter that directory by location uh, and area of expertise, uh, to share connections to your own social networks, uh, and to connect directly with each other. Um, it's a really powerful tool, and, and the point is uh, to be able to, to find those others who are seeking opportunities to collaborate as, as well. Uh, another way that we help <coughs> Uh, promote the outreach and information about what leaders are doing um, is by highlighting their their current activities. Uh, and one recent example is Ed Fallon, who's a, a Halt the Harm Network leader and the founder of the Great Climate March uh, for for climate action. Uh, Ed's currently uh, uh, walking the full 400 mile length of the proposed back end pipeline across his state of Iowa, uh, meeting with people along the way. Uh, to talk about the harmful impacts of expanding fossil fuel infrastructure projects uh, in Iowa and, and elsewhere. Uh, and by uh, talking to Ed and sharing information uh, about from his own blog, his, his daily updates, and, and sharing that with other leaders in the network uh, is an example of uh, the kind of efforts we're making to connect leaders with each other. Uh, as the network grows with new leaders, we'll also find opportunities to provide direct services and support to leaders in the network and to provide direct campaign support uh, to boost the efforts of our leaders to help them build capacity and scale up the impact of, of their work and their efforts. And again, uh, uh, today's webinar uh, and a series of webinars is, is another way that we can, we can do that by highlighting the work of leaders in the network. Uh, and today we've got a terrific topic. Uh, our first webinar was about the health impacts of fracking. Uh, today we're talking about tools, applications, websites, and resources uh, of use to advocates who are working to halt the harms of fracking. Um, these are sometimes tools uh, that are national in scope and can be used by anybody. In other cases, they're focused on a particular region, but we hope that they will provide good examples of things you might replicate uh, and learn from our speakers today uh, about uh, how they've, they've built the tools that they've, they've created. Um, the way the webinar is going to work, each of the panelists is going to speak for approximately 15 minutes. On the right side of the screen in your control panel, uh, you'll see a box for questions, and you can submit questions uh, at the end of the webinar. We will address as many questions as we can uh, after uh, all the presentations are complete. Um, and lastly, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available uh, online at halttheharm.net.tools. 
So, uh, the first of our speakers today is uh, Sam Malone. Sam is the manager of education, communications, and partnership uh, partnerships at the Frat Tracker Alliance, which is headquartered in Campfield, Pennsylvania, uh, but has offices across the country in California, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, and New York. And uh, Sam's going to be talking to us today about the Frat Tracker mobile app. Thanks for joining us today, Sam. Thanks for having me. Let me get my screen shared here. So I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss the work of Frack Tracker Alliance. Thanks so much for having me, and um, we'll also be talking about the mobile app that we have developed. So just to give you a general idea of what I'd like to cover in the presentation today, here's a general outline. I'll quickly go over what Frack Tracker Alliance is for those who are unfamiliar. Then I'll walk you through our new, new mobile app's features. And finally, I'll show you a case study how NPCA is using photos and data collected by our app to understand and communicate the risks that oil and gas development poses to Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. So here's a little about us. Frack Tracker Alliance is a registered 501c3 with nine staff members uh, serving across the U.S., as, as Chris mentioned. Um, we work with oil and gas data to understand the industry's impacts and trends. Our website, fracktracker.org, was actually launched in 2010, and it now provides oil and gas maps for over 36 U.S. states with drilling activity of all sorts. These maps can include anything from drilled wells, regulatory violations, pipelines, proposals, waste disposal sites, sand mining operations, you name it. Uh, maps are interpreted and contextualized by accompanying blogs, data analyses, and photos. So as we all know, since we're participating in this webinar today, um, unconventional oil and gas drilling, also generally referred to as fracking, is occurring with greater frequency in the U.S., with over 1.1 million active oil and gas wells across the U.S. 36 states are seeing some sort of activity with ranging levels of intensity. Kern County in California, for example, has over 120,000 active wells, many of which are utilizing unconventional drilling technologies such as acidizing. Because of the massive scope of this issue, we often map and analyze national data sets where they're available. In this map, for example, we're showing the number of organic farms currently operating near oil and gas activity. We also looked at the number that may be in the path of future shale gas development. Some of our most valued maps are showing state-level data. This map of Pennsylvania, for example, shows the following types of data. Compressor stations are shown in green. This is a partial data set that some partners of ours helped to compile. Pits are shown in blue and were crowdsourced using volunteers that another partner of ours, SkyTruth, coordinated. Violations are the yellow dots, drilled wells in orange, and permits in purple. Now, all of that data is provided online through the PA Department of Environmental Protection. On, on our maps, there's a capacity to zoom. And by zooming in, you can see some each of these points in better detail and even click on them to learn more. One point might have several data layers at that location. So in this example, we see that a violation has been issued here. Also at this point would be a permit and wells drilled layers. Now, it's impossible to be an expert on every subject that could potentially intersect with oil and gas activity, and there's only nine of us. <laughs> because of this, we often collaborate with other groups on thematic or timely projects. These projects often involve grassroots data collection due to the many data gaps that exist in the oil and gas world. We felt that a mobile app that lets people submit reports in the field and see where oil and gas activity is occurring near them, which is in a way similar to our online maps, could be a really useful tool for this purpose. So after a, a lot of work and beta testing with some wonderful partners, we launched the app in the fall of 2014. It's now available for iPhones and Androids for free and can be downloaded from fracktracker.org forward slash app. So now that you have a bit of background on us and the Frack Tracker app, let's explore some of the features in closer detail. Now, of course, the first step to using our app is downloading it, um, but once you launch the program on your phone for the first time, you will be asked to allow the app to access your location. Doing so helps the map and reporting features work more effectively. Tap Allow to continue. 
Since this is the first time you'll have used the app, we also ask that you sign in with your name and email address. We won't spam you with emails, but providing your real email address does help in the event you have questions about your submissions or problems with the app. Then tap Save to continue. Next you will see a map of the US. Every time you log in from here on out, this will be the first screen that you come to. The shades of, the, of blue on the map reflect well density by county, with darker blues indicating more wells. The blue dot is actually shown here, was where I was when I took the screenshot of this, is your location. The red dots are user reports, but we'll get into that in a, in a bit. Zoom in to explore wells and reports by region. Now if there are a lot of wells, you may need to zoom in quite closely to see them individually. Place two fingers on the map and separate them to zoom in, and to zoom out, you just pinch your fingers. This is similar to actually how um, Google Maps would work on your smartphone. There are three main navigation items on the bottom toolbar all of the time. The oil and gas map, which you see here, the reporting button, button in the middle, and then my submissions tab on the right. The top toolbar will change depending on the page that you're viewing. For this page, we see that the toolbar on the top offers a legend and a screen refresh option. So I'm going to pretend to tap on the legend, and so then we'll take over so you can see what the legend would look like. So here um, you see what each dot or color on the map means, and you can also see that it shows user reports and both unconventional and conventional oil and gas wells. There's a lot of reasons for this, but generally um, a lot of times it's very hard to tell the difference between different types of conventional and unconventional wells, but we did our best. Um, and below the legend we kind of explain the difference and how we, we made that distinction between the two types of wells. So we're going to go back to the oil and gas map. To we're going to explore a particular site more closely. So once you zoomed in on the map, tap on a dot to learn more about the site. A pop-up box will then display with the basic information about the point. So this well in southwestern Pennsylvania, for example, is called the Carnes Donald Unit and is operated by Range Resources. To see more details about that location, you would tap the blue eye. Uh, once you go into that some more detailed information, we'll try to provide as much information about that particular site as we can, um, such as the well's API number or the date that the well was drilled. That's also called the spud date. Okay, so say you were out for a hike and you see an oil and gas issue that you would like to share with others. Next I'll show you how to submit your own report to add to this map. So first you would just tap Submit Report button in the bottom toolbar to get started. So this screenshot is what the report form looks like, where you can share observations about oil and gas activity near you. The first box is for the date that you noticed an issue or took a particular photograph. The next line is a drop-down menu that allows you to select for the type of issue you observed, if any. Facility type and location type are additional descriptors that you can include if you would like. Comments is an area where you can include miscellaneous information about this report. Um, to say you wanted to include something like, the air smelled like petrochemicals here. Credit refers to whether or not you would like to receive credit for the photo that you attach to this report. This was actually a field that we added, um, Melissa Troutman's on the line here. She, uh, they wanted to be able to collect photos as, as a, from a specific project and group them together. Um, and to do that, you would just keep a consistent tagline in the credit field. None of the fields in the reporting form are necessary to fill in, but the more detail, the better. Tapping on the dark box will allow you to add a different location to your report other than where you're currently standing. So this feature helps if you're no longer in the field, um, if you didn't have adequate cell phone service when you noticed the issue or took a photograph. The last green box is how you upload your photo from your smartphone. You can either add a photo you took previously or take a new one right from the app. Then tap Save in the upper right-hand corner to submit, or Cancel to go back without submitting your report. All submissions then go into a queue for us to review, so don't worry if you've submitted something by mistake. Once we've approved your report, a red dot will appear on the oil and gas map based on the location you provided. 
To find your previous submissions and see their review statuses, tap on My Submissions in the bottom toolbar. This screenshot is the page you'll see when you first go to your submission list. Now, in this one, I only hit one. Um, and if you tap on that particular submission, you'll be taken to its report page and photo, as shown here. And finally, if you would like to share any point on the map via social media, go to its report page, like you see on the screen, and tap Save in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. To give you an idea of what this app can help advocates accomplish, I'll walk you through this case study. In May of last year, Frack Tracker worked with the National Parks Conservation Association, or NPCA, to document oil and gas development in the vicinity of Theodore Roosevelt National Park in western North Dakota. Teddy Roosevelt Park includes 70,000 acres of beautiful badlands that house herds of bison, elk, wild horses, and bighorn sheep. NPCA was primarily interested in potential impacts on the park itself, as well as the experiences of park visitors. Seeing how parks are being impacted by activities outside their borders can be a powerful step toward determining better ways to protect national parks. With the help of the app, 20 volunteers spent two days driving around the park recording images of wells, flares, oil trucks, trains, pipelines, and other products of the Bakken oil boom. Hundreds of photos were taken by these dedicated volunteers, Frack Tracker, NPCA, and Kestrel Aerial Service, chronicling oil and gas infrastructure and impacts, as well as wildlife and scenic vistas. These images and the final map shown here are helping NPCA understand and communicate to industry and governmental agencies the park values at stake. So in summary, the pace of oil and gas drilling and associated activities is extremely fast in many parts of the country and the world. The numerous data gaps make this issue a pretty difficult task to track for any group. And you'll see in the rest of this webinar that Frack Tracker isn't the only group working on this issue and providing tools for advocates, but we hope that you'll find our mobile app useful in your own endeavors. If you have any questions about how to use the Frack Tracker mobile app, feedback on ways to improve it, because we're always, always tweaking it, or inquiries about other ways to get involved, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And that's it for me, so thanks so much. Thanks, Sam, that's exciting. I really appreciate you showing that, and I'm sure uh, uh, we'll see a spike in, in downloads and uh, new reports being submitted via the app. Our next speaker today is Claire Donahue, who is the Program Director of the Scene Energy Project based in New York. Uh, Claire's going to be talking to us about an interactive map of New York shale gas infrastructure that they've developed called You Are Here. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Claire. Hi. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm the Program Director for Sane Energy Project. We're located in New York City. Uh, we've been focused on replacing shell gas infrastructure with renewable infrastructure since our founding in 2011. Um, at that time, most of New York City was just getting up to speed about fracking and, and trying to stop it from happening here. Um, at this point, drilling may have been stopped in New York, but we realized very early on that the shale gas infrastructure would be a huge issue um, all up and down the eastern seaboard, um, especially with the push towards export. Um, we realized we needed a visual overview of what was happening, a way to demonstrate the big picture of the industrial network. And I've always been a map geek, so I started trying to get a map made. Um, putting together this You Are Here map took over two years. Uh, basically, we knew there were all these proposed pipelines, um, but we needed to see how they all fit together and how they networked with whatever existed. And when we started out, we knew none of that. Uh, all of this information, the data points, um, all, all the longitude and latitude, the docket numbers, the status of each project had to be, um, had, had to be uh, researched and um, collated and put into spreadsheets. That was an enormous undertaking, and dozens of our allies from across New York State contributed to that and proofread it afterwards. Um, and we simply lucked out with uh, finding someone who was technically uh, adept at and willing to code all that data and bring it to life. Tony Schlein, who's a member of the New York City Grassroots Alliance, uh, had the misfortune to walk up to me after a meeting and introduce himself as a programmer. Uh, and I was like, I've got a project for you. So, uh, that's how this map came to be. Um, and what we'd like to do is 
demonstrate how this map works, how you can use it, and uh, then talk about some of the things that became apparent to us um, once the map existed, because there were things that we didn't know until the map was online and we could see it all together. So um, just uh, starting in terms of how to use this map, in the lower left corner, you'll see this little box here, and this is how to use this map. So I'm going to walk through how to use this map, but if, if you're ever on this you know, page and you get lost or confused and you don't know what to do next, just go to this map and it will tell you how to work the, the, the map. And then if you have something to add, if there's something you see on this map that needs a clarification or an update, uh, the status has changed, or if you, you know of a new project near you that we haven't included, all you have to do is um, click here and you'll come up with this Google feedback form. And if you can fill this out, then we can add your information onto the map and make sure that everybody sees it. And if you're tooling around this map and, and you know you want to zoom in and this box is in the way, there's a minimize button right there so that you have more uh, sort of visual area to play with. Then moving uh, clockwise around the screen, uh, here's, your, here's your zoom button. So when you want to come in on an area, uh, just click the zoom button. And then to move around, just click and hold and you can manipulate the map. You can see that it, it takes a little while uh, for the map to redraw. Um, you'll also see that as you click in, as you zoom in, um, the, the map will, will reset itself. Um, but then you'll also uh, notice that the closer in we get, um, the, uh, the, the, the thicker and more transparent the, the lines become. That's because uh, we didn't want to get into trouble with Homeland Security saying that we were giving away any information. All of the information on this map is publicly available, but when you come in really close on this map, you'll see that um, uh, the, the route of the pipelines and the position of things is a little blurry, and that's on purpose. Um, the, the next big tool that we have is the uh, layers. That's this over here. Um, so you'll see everything is color-coded so that all of the operational pipelines are in shades of blue. They're all in cool blues or purples. Um, the compressor stations are routed along the pipelines, and they're all yellow. So all the yellow dots are compressor stations. Uh, proposed pipelines are in warm colors, so they're orange and red. Power plants are in hot pink. Um, you can see that they're clustered. Waste and storage uh, treatment uh, is um, in brown. Storage and support is in green. And other facilities, things that were uncategorized, are in gray. So one thing you can do is you can turn these layers on and off. And one thing that um, makes it very easy to, to sort of explore this is to go layer by layer. And we learned a lot just by doing that. So um, other facilities, uh, there's just a couple of them. We have uh, the, the Mannheim CNG station up here. Um, we've got a water withdrawal site in Painted Post. And we also have the big uh, Port Ambrose LNG uh, project that's down here by us in New York City. Uh, if you turn on just the storage and support, you'll see that that's centered right along here, uh, coming up out of Pennsylvania, heading towards the big Seneca Lake salt cavern storage. Uh, and then there's all kinds of rail yards and the center at Horseheads, which is an enormous industrial site where uh, silica sand, chemicals, and water are all stored and transported from. So things go back and forth along this route all the time. Over here in western uh, New York, we haven't been able to complete this uh, layer completely, but this is one of the biggest gas storage fields. It, so over here in this area, there are lots of depleted gas wells that are now being used for storage. We hope to have time to, to bump up this layer soon, uh, because there are a lot more storage wells over here in that area. One of the most disturbing things we discovered was all about uh, the waste treatment. All of the um, waste treatment uh, that's coming out of Pennsylvania, drill cuttings and fluids that are being transported into New York landfills are happening here along the Pennsylvania border. There's also several um, disposal sites up here along the sort of top of the Finger Lakes. There are three um, there's a water, there's a landfill up here in Waterloo that stopped accepting waste but did accept radioactive drill waste. 
there are also a couple of injection wells. Most people don't understand that we have injection wells um, here in New York, but there are three of them. And Mary Menapes has contributed that information to us. Um, there's also, in addition to um, the landfills, the Shimon County landfill is one of the, the biggest problems in terms of accepting radioactive drillways from Pennsylvania. Um, we also have uh, lots of, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it, um, wastewater treatment plants. The, the water treatment plants accept the leachate that comes out of these landfills. So that's, that's a big problem. Uh, and there's several of those you can see along here. Um, there's also brine spread spreading that's happening all over this area, 13 counties. Uh, the power plants, if you look at the power plants, you'll see that a lot of the power plants, especially the older ones, are centered along water um, because they used to obviously use water for, for power and for um, also disposal. What's new is things like the CP Valley um, power plant, which is uh, proposed uh, down in Orange County. That's not centered around a big body of water. That's centered around a pipeline and a new compressor station. Um, the operational pipelines, now you start to see the overview of how this system works in New York. Um, I'll, turn, I'll turn off uh, the other layers so that we can focus on pipelines for a moment. Um, the pipelines basically um, had, what had been happening with pipelines is that they uh, focus, they, they used to be transporting gas in one direction. So it used to come in from Canada at, at Niagara and in from Canada from the north and travel from west to east. So all of these pipelines traveled west to east and from Pennsylvania up west to east and then down uh, to the New York market, to the Albany market. And then there were, there were a couple of pipelines that came up the east coast and into New England. What's different now that we've discovered is that all of these pipeline companies are reversing the flow of their pipelines. They're, the big new word in pipelines is bi-directional. Um, companies want to be able to send their gas in every direction. So we now have a situation where they want to send gas north to Canada and west to Canada. We are already exporting gas to Canada through the Niagara Falls connection. Um, and most of the new compressor station upgrades and additional pipelines that are proposed are to facilitate that change, to make pipelines bi-directional and to get gas towards export. Um, so now you have all the pipelines. Now we add the compressor stations. You can see that um, you know compressor stations are um, they're they're already existing along all these pipelines. But what happens with pipelines, and this this can be demonstrated by the proposed pipeline. Um, here are uh, two of two of the biggest new proposed pipelines. Uh, this is the Constitution Pipeline and the NED Pipeline, the Northeast Direct Pipeline. Uh, proposed for almost the exact same route. Uh, the Constitution Pipeline, when it was proposed to FERC, um, they said they were, weren't going to need any compressor station ex uh -huh. except uh, right here at the existing right compressor station. Um, they um, said they would enlarge that. The NED Pipeline, however, filed for two compressor stations, which is more realistic because pipelines generally need compression every, at least every 40 miles, sometimes as often as every 7 to 10 miles. And if there's a hill, uh, a compressor station will be added. For instance, the Millennial Pipeline, which is this green line going across, right sort of hugging the border of Pennsylvania and New York, the Millennial Pipeline, when it started, did not have additional compression. And just in the last two years, compression has been added here in Hancock because you can see it's called the Henry Hill Compressor Station. There's a hill, and they needed to push the gas up the hill. So they added this huge com compressor station there. And then, of course, in Minisync, a, a really horrible situation where a compressor station was added uh, to, a, to a community full of 9-11 first responders with, with, with lung disease. Uh, so that's one of the things to know is that as you add pipelines, you're also adding compressor stations, and then as you add compressor stations and pipelines, you're adding gas uh, power plants. That's the next thing that's sort of begot out of pipeline, pipelines being added. So in terms of using this map, one of the unique features of this map is that it was always intended to connect users to 
uh, to the uh, community that is fighting that project. So here, for instance, we have the uh, NED pipeline. If you hover over a dot, the box, uh, the pop-up box will come, and if you click on it, the box will stay. In this box, you'll see what you need to know, the basic facts of this, what's the name of the project, and, and also there are some projects have multiple names, so it's also known as the TGP NED. Who's the operator? Kinder Morgan is the company building this. It will bring you to links uh, that show you more about this articles and, and other information. Then it will, it will bring you to the groups who are fighting it. So you can click these links and be connected to the organizations uh, that are fighting it. Or you can, you can also get uh, an email, uh, for instance. This, this is one of the groups that's fighting uh, the, the, the NED pipeline in New York, um, the Constitution uh, pipeline and, and the NED pipeline. So that's a way for you to be connected directly to the group that's fighting it. Uh, if you want to move on and you want to get rid of that box, you just click um, that, that data in the center. And uh, if, it, if at any time uh, you can't get any of these boxes to close, you can, you can just refresh your browser button and you'll be brought back to the uh, home page so you can start over. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, once you get once you get used to using this map and you sort of know the layers by color, you can also minimize that so that you can really make the most of zooming in and out uh, on these projects. Um, one one of the things I just want to say before we finish up um, and um, is you know this map was created in collaboration with dozens of our allies from upstate New York, um, and and one of the things that we wanted to do. Um, was was to show people that um, this is not this is not just um, places on a map, but these are real people. So we did this art project where we had uh, all of the contributors to this map take photographs of themselves with our "You Are Here" map pin in the place where the harm is. So this is this is uh, people from STP, Stop the Constitution, along the route of the Constitution pipeline. This is us, Sane Energy Project, in the West Village where the Spectre Pipeline comes in. This is the location of an injection well up in the Finger Lakes. Um, th these are the people who are fighting uh, the mini sink compressor station and uh, now the, the uh, CPV Valley power plant. That beautiful field is where they want to build this power plant. It's a greenfield power plant. These are the folks from Paws, New York, who are fighting the Pilgrim Pipeline, another new proposed pipeline. It's the only non-gas pipeline on our map. It's an oil pipeline that will transport Bakken uh, oil. And here are the people from uh, People for a Healthy Environment up in Chemung County fighting all this horrible um, waste disposal that's going on in the southern tier. And just uh, one last thing is um, we, we focus only on New York State because that's kind of the bandwidth we have for the moment. We're now trying to get this map expanded to connect the lines through the entire northeast region. This is a map that was created by Bill Houston uh, from Binghamton. Uh, these, are, these are the major pipelines in New York State, but you can see how it works towards export. The stars are all the point, points where this, it can be exported. So you can see how all of these pipelines network towards export up to Nova Scotia, towards Massachusetts, potentially even in New York City uh, off of um, the Port Ambrose project and then down to Maryland. Um, where Coast Point is, is been proposed. Um, so we've been doing forums all over the state showing how this map works. If you would like to have a forum in your town, please get in touch with us. And the way to do that is to click right here where it says Sane Energy Project. You'll come up, um, <laughs> okay, it's not going to work. Here we go. Uh, you'll come up to our website. There's lots of information here. Um, on our uh, infrastructure uh, set of pages, you'll see uh, operational projects, proposed projects. We have a page for each of the projects that are currently uh, being proposed that will give you more information about it. We have a page about the track record of the builders, all the terrible things they've done. And then um, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, just enter your, your email address here. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for this presentation. And uh, we hope that everybody will find this, this useful in fighting fracking. Thanks so much.
Thank you, Claire. What a what a terrific resource. As, as someone who who loves maps and uh, and so many of the wonderful things they they show us, it's it's a, a powerful tool to to see uh, where these infrastructure uh, harms uh, come right through our own uh, neighborhoods. Our next speaker is uh, Melissa Troutman. Melissa is the co-founder and executive director of Public Herald, a Pennsylvania-based nonprofit organization that's dedicated to investigative journalism in the public interest. Uh, and Melissa is going to be talking to us about <coughs> their new tool, File Room. Thanks for joining us, Melissa. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here um, to present uh, our organization and some of the work we're doing, but also with um, Frack Tracker and Sane Energy Project. Those are really, really great tools. So again, I'm Melissa Troutman. I'm the director and co-founder of Public Herald, an investigative news nonprofit dedicated to journalism in the public interest. Um, since the fall of 2011, we've produced about 30 reports a documentary called Triple Divide, and an open source file room, all of which are dedicated to helping the public understand the true extent of the harms of fracking and the mechanisms that help create these harms and allow them to persist. Today I'm going to focus in on our file room project. And as you'll see, Frack Tracker is one of our partners. They actually make um, the maps that we use at, at file room. So as journalists, our goal is to create transparency around the harms of fracking, to tell stories that the mainstream media is not, and to give the public tools to help achieve accountability. Um, we do not take a position on fracking. Uh, we want to remain open to all perspectives. That said, we do cover the impacts of fracking, and we certainly aren't shy about how negligent public and industry officials have been about acknowledging these harms, um, and tracking and fixing the problems that people are facing. So for our work, um, we conduct interviews and all that good reporter stuff, but we're also scanning files every month, um, every week sometimes, at the Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP, which regulates oil and gas in Pennsylvania, where we're based and our reporting is focused for the time being. The files we obtain are very, very revealing um, on both a hyperlocal level as well as a regional and state level. Um, at the file room, you're going to see both the, ma the macro and the micro story, similar to the work by Frack Tracker and other organizations. Um, but what, what's unique about file room is that you're getting the actual files themselves, not just the information about the existence of that file, though that is important as well. And seeing the actual files is important because, like anything in life, the devil is in the details. And when you're trying to address the harms from fracking on a case-by-case -case basis, um, like many impacted residents and scientists and attorneys and, and other folks are trying to do, you need to be able to see the details, right? Um, if still, the larger context is also necessary um, in order to highlight the fact that these individual cases are not isolated. So how can those of you um, who are addressing the harms use File Room and Public Herald for your work? Uh, well, first let's get, let's get oriented to the File Room itself. So on the left-hand side, you will see um, a list of file types. Right now we have complaints, permits, waste and GMI, or gas migration investigation files. And this list will expand with time. Um, we have a few other tabs here, but uh, we'll get to those later. For now, we'll just focus on, oh, once you hover over a file type, um, or if you click on a file type, I'm sorry, if you click the file type, you'll be taken to a page that describes um, the type of information in that file. Um, but for now, let's 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 do some exploring. Let's say let's say you live in or want to look at files, um, complaint files specifically for Bradford County. Complaint files are um, reports that are made to DEP regarding water contamination and other pollution incidents related to oil and gas operations. So somebody calls DEP, DEP files 
the report as, an, as a complaint and gives it a complaint number. So if we click on Bradford County, oops, it will take us to the Bradford County Complaints page. You'll see a map of all the complaint files by township. And below that map is listed each and every individual complaint file, which is also organized by township alphabetically. So back to the map. Um, actually, back to the file. Let's stick at the files. Right now, complaints can be downloaded or printed individually. Um, if somebody wants to download or print a hard copy of all of the complaints in Bradford County or any other particular county, they can use our contact page um, to make a request and we'll send them a link to an aggregate of all the complaints in that county. Right now we're not putting that link to the county data set online because it's often being updated and we constantly have to switch out that link and it, right now it's just easier to send it to um, for individual requests. Now back to the map. Um, the colors on the map correlate to the number of complaints within a specific township for this file set. Um, the darker the color, the more complaints there are. So let's look at a particular township. This one's nice and red, so we'll click on this. And this is Wyalusing Township. So the, um, this pop-up box, which is the same pop-up box you will get at other Frack Tracker maps on Frack Tracker's website. Um, the pop-up box contains the county, of course, the municipality, um, the total number of complaints, which for Wyalusing Township is 26. Um, 22 of those complaints are water complaints, and four are labeled as general. Now, these are DEP's labels, and when DEP labels a complaint as general, it doesn't necessarily mean that that general complaint is not about water contamination. So, so it's kind of confusing. But once you um, click on individual files, you can see the details, and, and um, that would be clear. So why Wyalusing Township, let's take a look at a particular file in Wyalusing Township. So we scroll down to the list of files for Wyalusing. And if we click on a particular file, up pops um, the file which is uploaded to Document Cloud, which is what Public Herald uses to upload our files to the file room. And each complaint includes the details of the call made to DEP, the date the call was made, the inspector and supervisor in charge of investigating the complaint. Um, many times the complaint will include uh, determination letters, so DEP's decision on the matter, and the date the complaint was resolved. Um, sometimes, but not always, DEP will include water test analyses um, that it conducted during its investigation. Um, and I could really talk all day about the intricacies of just these complaint files in particular, um, but for the sake of time, I'll direct you to um, if you back at the file room um, page, you can see on the left-hand side file reviews. And if you click this, it gives you more information about file reviews in general. But also, we have published our first informational zine, or a how-to review um, file room zine, particularly about complaint files. Um, this uh, was created um, with the collaboration of John Nicholson, which is one of our file team members for, for the file room, and he's also an artist and created this amazing cover. So this document takes you through the steps um, for accessing these files, interpreting these particular files, and eventually we'd like to publish a guide for every type of file in the future. Um, but right now, file room is just beginning, and we have much room to grow. File Room is a collaborative open source project, which means that it's open to the public for anyone to use and contribute to. Um, so anybody collecting files can contact us to add them to the file room. And if you'd like to see a particular kind of file 
or files from a particular location added to the file room, just contact us and we can work together to make that happen. And the way you can contact us is by just hovering over about and clicking on our contact page. Right now, Public Herald maintains the site and we started the file room, but this project is meant to be carried forward by the public. And right now it's being carried forward by the folks um, in the file team. So how can, what are some ways that you can use this data? Well, one of the ways these files are important is as evidence at meetings and hearings, for example. Um, when people go to their elected officials for direction or help um, for the harms from fracking development, they're not getting very far with public officials. And what's worse is that many people report being dismissed by their public officials, um, labeled as irrational or as fear mongers or as spewing propaganda about the harms from fracking. And the only way to stop this type of dismissive attitude is to provide direct and impactful evidence that public ha officials have to acknowledge. Um, so this is a story that we published on Public Herald about a group of residents in Bradford County who are doing just this. Um, taking files from the file room directly to their officials um, so that they can start to, to, to address the issues. Um, another way you can use it that's also featured in this story is, um, you know, citing the total number of violations or the total number of complaints, for example, in Bradford County or whatever county you live in um, is a good factoid to use at a public meeting or hearing. But it's much more powerful to have the actual inspection and violation reports with a field inspector's notes and photographs of the actual actual pollution. And you can get that from um, several kinds of files from DEP's office. Here you can see um, pieces of an, a violation inspection report with pictures of the field inspector's um, observations. Also, it's one thing to cite the total number of contamination cases that DEP might list for a given area, but being able to quote specific, specific chemical analyses for water wells that have been impacted in your area um, is, is much more powerful. Residents have used individual files in permit appeals before the State Environmental Hearing Board. Um, they've used them to hold local officials accountable for brushing off local problems. And also for asking bigger questions, like um, how, how many water contamination cases are we willing to allow in our community before we decide to do something about it, before it's too many? Um, so, so many harms from fracking are treated as merely anecdotal. And you know, our goal is to have the documents to back up these harms. Um, you, know, you know the saying, knowledge, knowledge is power. So, Another way to use the files is to uh, look at specific plans for specific types of development. Um, and I, I want to be clear that you know these files, all these files are available from DEP, but our goal is to make them easy to access and include them in maps, you know, to aggregate and visualize what's happening. Um, let's see. Individual permits for well sites, waste impoundments, et cetera, include details that are unavailable anywhere else but in those files themselves. Um, waste report. I'm going to pull up a waste report from that I accessed from the file room. Waste reports, for example, give you the amount of each type of waste produced by a specific company, where that waste is going in some cases. <laughs> um, not in all cases. The other thing that's revealed in these files is what the industry does not have to report. For example, the industry does not have to track or provide chemical analysis in Pennsylvania of individual loads of waste from particular sites, um, even though radioactive levels of certain kinds of waste vary from site to site. It is in permit files where the public can access details such as where the horizontal wellbore will be drilled under which properties, in what direction, 
This is a plat map from a permit file that is uploaded to the file room. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, a, a dotted green line that shows the horizontal, horizontal well bore here. Um, it also details the total number of drinking water wells that would be in a given area around the well site. And that can lead a researcher or, um, or anybody else, really, to, to individual water well owners to offer additional testing or information, for example. Um, and another thing that these files are good for is to ascertain whether regulatory officials are doing their job. Um, by being able to access DEP's investigation files, uh, Public Herald was, is able to find the evidence we've, we and residents have found evidence of DEP manipulating certain investigations in ways that are negligent at best and blatantly unlawful in others. This is a story about uh, a family um, who was not given uh, replacement water during DEP's investigation. And you can read more about that on Public Herald. Um, so that is the gist of um, the file room so far. Right now, most, um, most of the county data for our complaints is actually not uploaded yet. Now let me click on one other county. We'll click on Potter County, where I'm from. Um, so once this loads, you'll see that there isn't any, there aren't any files listed um, under Potter County, and there's no map. But in May, Public Herald will release its largest data set to date, all complaint records for 16 counties, as well as a state map, um, again mapped by Frack Tracker. Um, and this will be updated. The file room will be updated um, as we continue to gather county data sets. So file room will be updated on an ongoing basis, and we encourage you to subscribe to publicherald.org, where we'll announce new data sets as they become available. And you can do that on our website on the home page. And with that, I will hand it back over to Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was uh, really impressive, and, and what a, uh, an amazing uh, volume of material you have and, and so much more to come still. Um, we've been getting a lot of uh, good questions submitted, and we're going to wrap up the uh, final about 10 minutes here, uh, getting to as many of them as we can. So uh, feel free to continue submitting them. We also wanted to flag for you that uh, we're going to be using the hashtag TrackFrackHarms. Uh, and so we can follow up so, uh, with some questions and, and other follow-up uh, comments online. Uh, I want to start uh, with a, kind of a combined question for Sam. Uh, uh, one audience member asked uh, if there are other things you can track with the application, you know, such as farm animal kills or sites where water's been contaminated wells or a lawsuit filed even. Um, or additionally, someone else asks um, about the importance of having data about pristine characteristics of landscapes before drilling or infrastructure harms have, have impacted them and, and gathering the evidence of, uh, of an area you know, before it's actually been, been harmed. Sam, are you there? There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so uh, the first part of the question was different types of issues that you can track. Yes. So of, of the different kinds of issues that are on the app, um, we have it broken down into some basic categories. So there's um, water pollution confrontation. So this would be with a company or a DE, you know, a regulatory person or a neighbor. Um, there's also trails, uh, like trail relocation, scenic degradation, impaired wildlife, which would include the, the agricultural impacts, um, significant noise, unpleasant odors, and then of course there's the ever-encompassing other uh, category. And a lot of this is, it's great if you guys can categorize it, but if, you know, if you're looking at it and you're not really sure, um, it's something that you can contact us and ask for help in, in how to categorize it. And, and because right now, we're still at that point where a lot of the data is being collected so that we can start to see some of those trends over time. 
Um, the second question was talking about baseline, and that, that is imperative to collect information um, through the app or otherwise uh, on what what an area looks like or a community looks like prior to drilling. Uh, you may not see impacts, but you can never really demonstrate that there were any if you don't have baseline information. Uh, so that's really important and a, and a great question. So for example, with um, NPCA, they were actually, that a lot of that primarily was baseline information for inside the park because the, the wells were um, kind of surrounding the park, but there weren't really any specifically in the park. So that's exactly what they were doing, was demonstrating baseline uh, information and how the park was already being impacted by the surrounding um, wells. Gotcha, I see. That was a terrific example of that. Um, Claire, a question yeah, you mentioned during your presentation uh, that the You Are Here New York map was two years in the making and uh, required the, the help of a, a large number of, of collaborators. Uh, I guess it both be perhaps daunting and uh, encouraging to know that most people are interested in knowing, um, will it be expanded? I think you, you mentioned briefly about uh, growing into to New York regions, but clearly on the map with so many places where it hits the Pennsylvania border or, or other areas, have, have, has SANE been contacted by other groups uh, or other states looking to replicate the model of your work? Um, yeah, we, well, we actually reached out um, last, last October. We um, created a, a coalition of groups of sort of in the Northeast region from basically New York up to Maine because um, the pipelines, the proposed pipelines in New York um, are going to cross over from Pennsylvania into Massachusetts and all the way up to New England. So uh, there's uh, a similar map of uh, from Massachusetts. Right now they just have the, the one pipeline on it. Um, there's a similar map um, uh, of Pennsylvania um, and and we've been contacted by people in New Jersey who want to have a map. But we actually have been talking to um, Frack Tracker because, um, because they're sort of the best known map uh, you know, organization. Um, and we're hoping that we can figure out a way to either collect all of these maps onto one page or if there's some way to, to collect this all into one map. None, none of the maps have the exact same information and we're, we're the only map uh, at this point that has all of the existing and proposed uh, pipelines and all of these other um, things kind of together. And then we, there are other maps that have a lot more on them, like the energy justice map has you know, every toxin known to man on their map. So they're very, very dense, but they actually don't have pipelines and compressor stations. So there's all these resources and we would like to get them all together on track tracker so that everybody can sort of choose what they need to see more easily. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, a question I have for you. You showed a picture at the end of your presentation and you talked a bit about the, the file room team. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about just the the, the challenge and, and the uh, hurdles uh, to be overcome, I guess, in, in hours and, and just the volume of the work of actually getting these paper records, you know, scanning them and, and, and getting making them available to the public as you have? Yeah, so it is very time consuming. Um, one of the things we're doing right now is conducting trainings for um, resident citizens community advocates um, to get them up to speed on the most efficient way to collect these files. Um, that's one of those things that we've done is created the, um, the how to review file room scene as I um, showed in my presentation. But we also do in-person trainings. Um, we have one next week with a group of folks in Butler County, Pennsylvania. We'll meet them at the EP's Northwest Regional Office in Meadville, PA, um, to do a file review. Um, it's there. We've gone through a huge learning curve with DEP just to understand which files to ask for. Right. So at first, we would ask, for example, how many cases of water contamination are there in Pennsylvania, and and we want to see the files. Um, related to those uh, determinations by, by the department. And 
we couldn't really get an answer. And at first, we got a certain type of file. But um, it wasn't until a resident who has had water contamination alerted us to the fact that we weren't getting the real bulk of the information because we weren't asking for the right file. And the resident instructed us that we had to ask for a GMI, which is a gas migration investigation file, which we did. And whoa, were we overcome with, with files. Um, so a lot of times the first step is knowing what to ask for and knowing your rights in asking for it, because sometimes DEP will deny your request. We've been trying to get the complaint files um, that I focused on in the presentation for years. And the EP has um, considered them confidential. And we had to be very persistent and CC um, our attorneys on a regular basis um, to finally um, get DEP to let us gather these files. And once we were allowed to do that, it took us six months of file reviews in order to do so. So um, there's a learning curve. But one of our goals for File Room is not just to make the files accessible um, and map them for visualization, but to, to help the public um, kind of uh, launch through that learning curve as quickly as possible. Thanks, Melissa. It's, uh, it's like, uh, like you mentioned, a daunting challenge, but it's exciting to hear about the, uh, the work you're doing, uh, training others to, to help in the task. Um, we've got lots of questions, and yet we're at time. Um, and so I want to, we're going we're gonna to wrap it there. Uh, I'm sure that all of our speakers uh, uh, are interested in, and would be happy to hear from those in our audience who would like to know more about their projects. Uh, one of the best ways to connect with each other, uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, would be to join the Halt the Harm Network. Uh, just by attending, uh, you've demonstrated an interest in uh, tools and efforts to halt fracking's harms. And so we invite you to come to halttheharm.net. Uh, and apply as a leader yourself. I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, today for an uh, uh, impressive and very informative uh, webinar. And with that, uh, we will wrap it up. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.